Welcome to another EduMed video and in this video we'll be going over advanced life support specifically in patients in the prone position on intensive care with advanced ventilatory support i.e. being intubated and ventilated. If you have a look at my previous video I discussed the patient who is prone on the ward who de develops a cardiac arrest and how to manage that. This is a slightly different kettle of fish. We'll talk a little bit about what you need to know in managing the patient who arrests whilst intubated or ventilated in the prone position. A suggested approach and protocol for managing these patients and some special considerations and things to look at if a patient does arrest in the prone position. I think it's important to really get into your mind the key principles of CPR and this so-called chain of survival because I think this is vital to understanding how to have a successful resuscitation. The first thing is to identify that the patient has had a cardiac arrest early. Now this shouldn't be too difficult on intensive care because each patient who's intubated and ventilated should have a nurse looking after them and watching their vital signs. As a general rule patient, patients shouldn't suddenly deteriorate and have a cardiac arrest on intensive care. It should always be pre um, preempted and predictable if they do arrest and very rarely patients can have primary arrhythmogenic cardiac arrests which can respond very quickly to shocking and so they do often do very well. Early CPR is vital and we'll talk a little bit about the nuances of that in the prone, prone patient. Now in ward patients it's very difficult to achieve the early CPR because um, the ward staff are not adequately um, given the appropriate level of PPE to give CPR immediately, that you must have level 3 PPE to start CPR because it is deemed an aerosol generating procedure. This is different to the level 2 PPE that would nurses and doctors wear because they're not generally speaking doing aerosol generating procedures. Early defibrillation is important and the mainstay of managing patients with arrhythmogenic cardiac arrests which tend to do a lot better than the non-arrhythmogenic cardiac arrests like PE, PEA and asystole. Now an important myth to dispel is that you can't do CPR in the prone position. You can and it's been proven to be quite successful. There was a case um, series uh, and a systematic review of the literature done in 2001 which actually suggested that 22 patients who were in the prone position who had CPR had almost half of them survived discharge and that was through purely giving them CPR in the prone position. So the question comes where would you put your hands to be able to do effective CPR for a patient in the prone position? And this um, study in 2017 quite nicely illustrated um, the best position. They looked at the CT chests of patients who had um, CPR and they found that actually at the point below the inferior angle of the scapulae, which effectively practically translates to the middle of the um, two scapulae, at the level of about T7, your hands will be over probably the widest part of the left ventricle in about 80% of patients. So the best place to put your hands is in between the scapulae at the level of T7, which translates to roughly the middle of the scapula. Most of the early papers, especially this one, talked about giving something called sternal counterpressure when doing CPR. What is sternal counterpressure? Well, if you imagine doing CPR, you're going to be pushing down. That's the spine that you see here. And you're going to be pushing down on that. Now, if you have a look at how a patient is usually positioned in for surgery, you can see the chest, generally speaking, hangs free. And by letting the chest hang free, if you imagine pushing down from here with your hands, sitting there, what's going to happen is the chest wall is just going to push forward. It's going to flex. So this is where the theory of having a hand in between the breast, uh, breasts at the level of the sternum and then each time you push down with a um, compression, you push up with your other, with 
another person pushing up with their hand, you can cause sternal counter pressure and therefore squeeze the heart and more effectively give a cardiac output. Now, this was really described for patients who are in this sort of position with the chest hanging free. In patients on the intensive care, usually what we have is a pillow across the chest. And so what you can do is rather than doing the sternal counter pressure, which is difficult and requires another person around the patient's bedside, which may already be quite crowded, what you can do is just take the pillows out and let the chest sit on the bed itself and then leave that to provide some counter pressure. Now, admittedly, the mattress is going to have some spring to it, but and so the external counter pressure might be even better, but realistically, that's probably the easiest way to start CPR is without the external counter pressure. And there are some papers suggesting that you can get effective cardiac output without external counter pressure and just doing CPR between the scapulae. So this is just to emphasize the position of the um, hands. So it's effectively in between the scapulae, which are sitting there. Now, the next question to ask is, how do you put your pads on? And again, another myth is that you need to put the patient in the supine position to be able to adequately place your um, defibrillator pads. That is not the case. And there are two ways in which you can place the pads. Probably the best way is putting one posteriorly to the left of the spine and the other one in the axillary region as you normally would. And by doing so, you'll provide adequate electrical pathway for the electricity to pass through the heart. Now, it is important to remember that this is your right and this is your left. Because the patient is in the prone position, everything's going to be flipped around the other way. If for any reason you can't put the pad on the back, you can also do a so-called side-to-side -side placement. This is where you put one on each side of the axilla and thus the electricity will pass through the heart between the two pads. Generally speaking, this diameter is quite large and so therefore there's a lot more electrical impedance and as such, it may not be as effective as this uh, configuration. However, it can be done that way. Say, for example, the patient has large um, ulcers on their back and therefore not able to put those pads on, you can use a side-to-side -side configuration as well quite effectively. There are a few principles to just bear in mind when thinking about a patient who has a cardiac arrest with COVID, either suspected or confirmed. The most important of this is you must have level 3 PPE before starting CPR. Now that's quite useful um, in intensive care because generally speaking all not doctors and nurses should be wearing level 3 PPE at all times and therefore you can start CPR straight away. This is in contrast to on the wards where they only have level 2 PPE as a matter of standard and then they'll have to upgrade to level 3 in order to start CPR. Just to reiterate what level 2 PPE is, this is a surgical face mask, so not the fitted face mask. Maybe some eye protection, some long sleeved um, gowns with waterproof and some gloves. This is very different to level 3 PPE that we expect all people who are attending a uh, cardiac arrest being involved with CPR should wear. That is a face shield to protect splash, a long-sleeved gown, usually a surgical gown which is waterproof, either one or two pairs of gloves, importantly a face fitted mask which is FFP3 or N95 rated and so able to filter out viral particles, potentially a hat to cover the hair and either some wipe clean shoes or some shoe covers to protect them from viral particles getting onto the um, feet. So let's think about the intensive care patient. So this is the patient who's intubated, ventilated, has developed severe respiratory failure and is being prone to improve both their oxygenation and CO2 removal. So 
this patient loses output. This is usually detected by um, the nurse through the arterial line or the um, SATS trace or by the pulse or by the patient's uh, signs and symptoms. Generally speaking, if they're prone, the only thing you're really going to be going off is the arterial trace and maybe the plethysmography trace and also, of course, the ECG. As soon as the patient loses output, they should call the crash buzzer and bring the defibrillator early. Whilst the defibrillator is being brought, it's really important to put the patient onto 100% oxygen and then check the airway. Now, this checking of the airway has a number of facets to it. Physically, having a look at the airway is important. Suctioning the airway is important. But also, just as important, is looking at the monitor. Every patient who is invasively ventilated should have a end tidal CO2 trace continuously running. Now, in a patient who has invasive ventilation and an end tidal trace, what you will see is the normal amplitude of the CO2 end tidal trace, which gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that is usually as the cardiac output drops or suddenly stops. That is normal in a patient who has a cardiac arrest. That will then go up if they get return of spontaneous circulation or if you give adequate CPR. That is very different to this end tidal CO2 trace. And this is something you should always look out for. What this shows is a good ventilation, a good ventilation, and then nothing. And what this indicates is that there is a disconnection between the level of the lungs and the ventilator. This could be anything from an accidental self-extubation to one of the limbs of the ventilator accidentally falling off or a disconnection in one of the tubings from the entitled, end from the endotracheal tube to the ventilator. So check the circuit and check the endotracheal tube if you see that. Always assume an accidental extubation. Now I said to check the airway physically and what you're looking for is to see whether the tube is kinked or if the tube has accidentally been pushed in too far and you've got an endobronchial intubation and then hypoxia and an arrest. So you look at the level of the teeth. Also have a look to see whether the tube is hanging out or has fallen out completely. A really important thing to do is to put a suction catheter down the endotracheal tube. Now, in this COVID-19 era, we all have end we have closed suction um, tubing, which means that you can pass an, a suction catheter that is continuously connected to the endotracheal tube. The suction is really important for two reasons. The first is that it'll suction out any secretions, and you will find that patients in the prone position, it's a fantastic way of removing secretions, but those secretions can then block the endotracheal tube and cause difficulty in ventilating or even complete blockage of the system, stopping ventilation altogether. The other useful thing about putting a suction catheter down is that if there is a kink or a bend in the endotracheal tube, which can sometimes be at the back of the mouth, so you can't see it physically, but you won't be able to pass the endotracheal tube down, then you know that the problem is physically something to do with the ET tube and it needs to be straightened out or you need to change it if it's blocked with a whole load of secretions. So really vital to put that suction catheter down early to check the airway. Always have a look at the end tidal CO2. If you've got adequate um, CPR, you should get some kind of CO2 trace. If you get nothing, if you get something like this, think that the tube may have been dislodged. As soon as you check the airway and you've given them 100% oxygen, start CPR. Generally speaking, there's going to be multiple people there already, so someone else can start CPR. Start the CPR in the prone position. This is in between the scapulae and just keep pressing. Before you start the CPR, it's usually helpful to take those pillows out just so that you've got a bit more pressure, you've got a bit more of a hard uh, surface upon which to press and therefore your cardiac pulsations are usually going to be better. And then whilst you're doing CPR, someone should have brought the defibrillator and then assessed the rhythm ASAP. If the um, rhythm shows VF or VT, 
then it is the standard defibrillation. So you can stack those shocks as well if you need to, but um, I would generally suggest going with the standard ALS algorithm, unless you're experienced, uh, so either an experienced registrar or a consultant in intensive care, where you can slightly deviate and do things like stacked shocks if you know the exact pathophysiology of what's going on. PEA is, um, or asystole, you need to go through all the standard things. The endotracheal tube, has it fallen out? Has it got blocked? Has the ventilator tubing got disconnected? A really important thing to think about is IV access and infusions. Sometimes when patients are prone, these lines can fall out. And so if they were very NORAD dependent before they got prone, then if that uh, has kinked, if it's blocked, or if you, someone's forgotten to switch it back on again after the prone, you may well have a situation where it's a, effectively an iatrogenic cause to the cardiac arrest. Then as soon as it's safe to do so, we want to deprone the patient. If you can't get a, um, a return of spontaneous circulation quickly for the patient, then you must try and get the patient onto the supine position. Not because CPR isn't effective, but it's just much more difficult to rule out all the reversible causes for a cardiac arrest in the prone position. This slide is really to highlight where people normally put their pillows for proning patients on the intensive care. You can see here there are two pillows underneath the chest and two at the uh, level of the pelvis. Now if you imagine trying to do CPR, pushing down, these pillows are just going to keep flexing. So what I would suggest is early on, before you start CPR, to pull these two pillows out. And then that way, the chest will sit flat against the bed, and therefore you've got a bit of a harder surface upon which to press down with your CPR. Now, if you are going to turn the patient, you need to have a second bed sheet. You put it over the patient, you wrap them up like a pasty by wrapping it with the lower bed sheet that the patient's lying on. Then you move the patient across and then you flip them over. Now, that does take a bit of time, even with the slickest of teams. And so CPR in the prone position is probably worth it till you have ruled out most of the 4Hs and 4Ts. And then at that point, you could think about deproning the patient. If it's just a primary arrhythmogenic reason, and say, for example, the patient's got a potassium of 7, and that's the cause, usually you'll be able to get the rhythm back fairly quickly with a combination of calcium, defibrillation, bicarbonates, hyperventilation, and so on. But if the patient has something which has caused them to have a more prolonged cardiac arrest, and you need to rule out things like tamponade, or um, tension pneumothoraces, it is much easier to do so in the supine position. So even if it means a short break in uh, CPR, it's worth deproning the patient so that you can do a full assessment of the patient. There are a few things to consider in prone patients that's relatively unique to proning. The first thing is secretions. Secretions can be really difficult things. The great thing about proning and one of the ways in which it probably works is that it removes a lot of secretions through gravity. Um, now, in doing so, you can block your filter, which is the HME filter, which is essentially just hygroscopic material. So it can very easily block and we should generally be changing them every 24 hours and reassessing them every 12 hours at a minimum. But they can block very quickly, especially in prone patients. The ventilator tubing can also get blocked as well. And what can sometimes happen is if you imagine the ventilator tubing forming a little U-bend, 
like this and it just keeps filling up with secretions when it's filled up with secretions up to here you've still got enough space for the gas to move away but if it fills up even more up to this sort of point here then there is no way for gas to actually get through and so you can get complete blockage and a complete ventilatory failure with these patients. So be very careful of that. Also endotracheal tubes can get a lot of crusting around them which can make it very difficult to ventilate patients. Also always check the endotracheal tube position. It is not uncommon for tubes to move in when the patients are prone just by the way in which their faces are put on the pillow. Also if the patient has been proned, but the abdomen isn't hanging free, what can happen is the abdomen pushes in, the diaphragm pushes up, and that can push the lungs up. And if the tube is sitting near the carina, it can push the tube down one of the bronchi, usually the right, and, uh, right bronchus. Of course, you can always extubate a patient. This could be if a patient is inadequately sedated or paralyzed and they cough, or just through gravity, it might just slip out if it's not been adequately secured. Be very careful if a patient accidentally extubates or there's a problem with the endotracheal tube. These patients I would consider as always difficult intubations and the reason is they can get facial and laryngeal swelling that can make it difficult to get another tube in and also the grade of intubation can be more difficult as well because everything, all the soft tissues are more swollen. It is worth considering that in the prone position, it's very difficult to rule out reversible causes. And that's why I suggest it's r worth relatively quickly trying to deprone the patient, even if it means a short break in CPR, if there's not an early reversible cause found. Now, a so slightly old school mantra that most older uh, intensive care doctors grew up with was that no patient on ITU should die without two holes in the chest and a drain. What that meant was bilateral thoracostomies and a pericardial drain. In the old days it was very difficult to actually rule out pneumothoraces and a, a cardiac tamponade and so you would almost as a matter of course put those things in. As time's gone on and we've got ready access to both ultrasound and to echocardiography it's less of a uh, less of an imperative to do this. I would, however, say, even in the best hands, ultrasound of the lung and looking for B line, uh, looking for B lines, looking for sliding sign, looking at M mode can be difficult, and so you can miss pneumothoraces. So my threshold for doing bilateral thoracostomies in patients who've had cardiac arrests, especially with severe respiratory failure on high ventilatory pressures. Is fairly low and I personally would not advocate using a needle, thoric needle thoracocentesis with a cannula on the intensive care unless you are inexperienced. Anyone who's experienced I would go first with a bilateral thoracostomy. It is much safer if you haven't caused a pneumothorax with the high ventilatory pressures by sticking a needle in you're going to cause a pneumothorax. And also, the air leaks that you get with um, positive pressure ventilation at high pressures tend to be quite high. And so a needle decompression very rarely lasts long enough or gives enough of a, a relief of pressure to have significant hemodynamic improvement. Pericardial drains I don't do very often now because actually just popping an ultrasound probe on the chest, you can see a pericardial effusion very easily and then treat it if you need to and it's not that common. Really important to check the gases. There are a couple of reasons that patients can get hyperkalemia. Obviously these patients are very unwell. Sometimes the filters don't work very well when the patients are in the prone position, especially if the lines are in the groins. But they can develop rhabdomyolysis, either through the disease process itself, or, and this would be rather shameful, but from poor pressure point care where you've got compression of um, the muscles for 16 hours, which is generally how long you have patients in the prone position.
Be wary of patients who have metabolic acidoses. Sometimes, if you haven't let the abdomen hang free appropriately, you can increase the intra-abdominal pressure for long periods of time and cause abdominal compartment syndrome, which essentially causes venous congestion of all the abdominal contents and therefore effectively are causing ischemia of all of these tissues. And then you can get subsequent leak of um, various metabolites and a progressive metabolic acidosis. It's usually quite easy to pick these patients up because their urine output drops off relatively quickly. However, if, you've, if they're already anuric because they're on the filter, you may miss this. Once they're in the supine position, I would treat them as you would any other patient in, as with the ALS algorithm. So you would assess the rhythm and as soon as you've got them supine, reassess the rhythm. You'll be surprised how often they sometimes just fall back into a sinus rhythm just through the turning them onto the supine position. If they're shockable, go down the shockable route, non-shockable, CPR, adrenaline as you need to, and then think about all the things that we usually think about with resus. So just to summarise the most important points, I think it's really, really important to emphasise you can do CPR in the prone position. And especially if you've got something that's easily reversible, like a dysrhythmia, start CPR, get the pads on, shock the patient, continue CPR. And if it's a short period of time and you get ROSC, fantastic. If you're carrying on for a while, then do think about deproning that patient, even if it means an interruption in CPR, because you then need to start thinking about other reversible causes. Do not approach any patient without your appropriate level of PP, and for CPR that is full level 3 PP. Early defibrillation, as is always, is the mainstay of good um, ALS care, and always check the airways and lines. You'll be surprised how often when patients are prone it is a problem with the airway or with lines having come out. And finally, Remember that advanced interventions, doing things like thoracostomies, echoes are so much easier in the supine position. So if you are struggling with the resuscitation of a patient, I'd have a low threshold for turning them supine. But you can always start CPR in the prone position to buy you some time to get enough people and to be able to coordinate that deproning in a safe and effective manner. I hope you found that useful. If you have, please like and subscribe to the channel. Um, and I will be updating more and more videos as we go along. Hit the bell notification and you'll get an, uh, a notification whenever I update one of those videos. Thank you.